The theme of tonight's talk is pitfalls for parties. Is it better to be independent? Uh, so we've got a few different speakers tonight here, not just from the Fusion Party. Uh, as usual, we have extended the invitation to um, to outsiders to help um, you know collaborate across the political, political ecosystem. Um, you know, they're not completely enemies. They're um, you know we can bounce ideas off um, different people, and I guess that's the beauty of our democracy. And so um, one of the speakers tonight, um, let's kick it off with you, Bridget. Uh, so Councillor Bridget O'Brien from Yarra City in Melbourne. Um, she's an existing councillor and is running for re-election. Um, so um, after these speakers, we'll open up the floor to some questions from the audience. Uh, so get ready for that. Um, we'll ideally have, uh, we're planning on having four speakers tonight. But um, Bridget, if you'd like to um, kick it off. Thank you, Owen. Um, yeah, I thought I'd give a bit of a, tell a bit of a story about my journey. Um, I was tapped on the shoulder to run in the 2016 council elections. Uh, at the time, I was working on my PhD. And so I said, OK, I'm happy to be a support candidate, but I really don't want to get elected. So basically, I was put I, they put me second on a ticket in a ward that we'd never had any success with. I did absolutely no campaigning in that ward and focused entirely on supporting other candidates that we thought had a much, much better prospects of actually getting elected. Suffice to say, I didn't get elected. But then in 2019, one of the Greens councillors resigned for, as a councillor and there was a count back. Um, the second person on the Greens ticket had actually resigned from the Greens party and so didn't want the role. And the guy on the top of my ticket had moved overseas, so he was no longer eligible. Um, so basically, I ended up as the Stephen Bradbury of local politics, the last one standing. Um, I've got to say it was a really steep learning curve getting elected midterm. I absolutely worked my butt off, um, thinking I may as well make the most of it. But I also had a taste of working with two other independent councillors in my ward. Um, we would collaborate, we would come to consensus decisions for the best outcomes for our community. But I also learned to lean on the expertise within my community. Um, so I guess people thought that I'd done a good job so um, when the 2020 elections uh, came around, a group of community members got together and completely ran my election campaign. They did everything, fundraising, letterboxing, everything. Anyway, on the back of that community swelling, swell of goodwill and support, I ended up being um, first elected. Um, for me, I guess this is really about being an independent is really about people power and doing politics differently. Um, I'm very inspired by the community independence pro, pro, project that's grown up out of the India, India experience of Kathy McGowan and then Helen Haynes, um, because it is about building a grassroots movement within the community. It's about accountability, integrity, and true community engagement to ensure those elected are act actually representing their community. So in 2020, I get elected as to three other independents. No ALP party members got elected and five Greens got elected. And I guess this is where I will start to talk about the pitfalls for parties. Because the Greens had a majority, um, they didn't need to collaborate with any of us with some experience. They basically got drunk on their own power and pushed through their own party agenda and whatever great ideas they came up with between themselves. Um, they weren't particularly interested in what the community thought and uh, as a result uh, pushed through many very unpopular policies. They didn't like the community turning up to council meetings to complain. So they basically changed the governance rules to make it harder for the community to participate in the council process. Meetings went from fortnightly to monthly. Uh, 
the, the public used to be able to just turn up to a council meeting and have my, five minutes to raise whatever they liked. Now they have to register 24 hours in advance. You have to submit your question in writing and you only get three minutes. Um, they also made it much harder to participate in the planning process. And I won't go into details about all of that, but this was a really sore point for the community, particularly those highly engaged, as planning is a very contested area, particularly in the inner city like our municipality of Yarra. Anyway, the basic upshot of the way the, the Greens were um, operating was that um, they've created a huge anti-party sentiment within our community. Uh, myself and two other independent councillors wanted to keep the community informed of many of the big decisions that were going to have huge impacts on uh, the, the community, but also these decisions wouldn't be, wouldn't see the light of day until, a, you know, less than a week before a council meeting. So the community wasn't informed about what was going to be foisted upon them. So we basically started holding street meetings across the whole municipality, not just in our own little wards. And um, we would get, you know, 30, 40, 50 people turn up to these meetings because of some of the big issues and big things that were happening across in Yarra, in the city of Yarra. Anyway, um, as an upshot of all of that, as a result of all these meetings, we now have uh, independent candidates standing for all nine council positions across Yarra. And I guess for me, the lesson here is that the community wants to have a say. They want a seat at the decision-making table and they want to trust that the person they elect will actually represent them. So I think, and this is probably even more so the case at the local government level, the arm of government closest to the, to the people. So I guess my message is that, um, you know, local government is a nuanced space and you need to be able to be flexible to truly help residents navigate the bu bureaucracy of council. So for me, being an independent gives me that flexibility, but it also means I can co collaborate with great colleagues such as people in the Fusion Party, et cetera. And I guess, so my lesson is don't get cocky and be flexible. That's what I would say. Thanks a lot, Bridget. Um, it's certainly a good lesson to keep in mind. And um, actually, it's interesting when you mentioned that point about um, having a seat at the decision making table. I guess, you know, different parties have tried to tackle it. Um, you know, there's the Flux Party in the past, for instance, you know, the idea of direct democracy voting on pretty much every decision versus, you know, other parties where um, there's like, a ruler or you know sometimes a ruler for life if we think of you know like uh, the pope in the past um you know they just make the decisions and um you can just pray that it's a good decision um but anyway, <laughs> yeah, we'll get more into the discussion at the end um so i'll i'll be our next speaker um so hi a bit more of an intro about me um so i uh I, in fusion i'm the secretary and the convener uh, I was previously a candidate for Aston in the federal election, and I'll be running again federally in Wills for the next federal election. Oh, that hasn't officially been announced yet, but uh, here's the here's the announcement. Anyway, um, so in thinking about uh, pitfalls for parties, um, I'll be covering three main areas where we can see um, a difference between parties and um, independents. Uh, so first of all is obviously um, ideas. So when we say uh, someone's independent, it's always, you know, in the context of something else. We're independent from this um, assumed other power. So when we might say, for instance, that Australia is independent, you know, we're implying that maybe we're not a vassal state of the United States. When a woman is said to be independent, the implication is that um, she's not financially dependent on a spouse. Uh, and so, you know, some people... Um, you know, being independent uh, means that you're not following someone else's agenda. And so, um, you know, sometimes the Fusion Party, for instance, gets questioned. Oh, I've got to admit someone in the room. Uh, Simon, if you have power, can you please <laughs> let people in the room as well? Um, but back to the talk, sorry. Um, if 
uh, sometimes the fusion party and other parties are questioned on um, whether or not we're following the doctrine of the World Economic Forum, the G20, the World Health Organization, that sort of thing. Um, and so this leads into my point that often independent is short for independent thinker. Um, you came to your own conclusions. You're not, you know, just drinking the Kool-Aid. Um, but, you know, why we don't often pitch candidates as quote unquote independent thinkers is because it's code for crazy people normally. You meet someone at the bus stop, they start telling you about aliens and magnets. <laughs> you really come to think to yourself, you know, wow, this person should be the next prime minister. I've never met anyone like this bloke. Um, but then, um, you know, that we see as well in terms of independent thinkers. Uh, so Fatima Payman, for instance, was recently expelled from the Labor Party federally because, you know, she had a difference of thought from the Labor Party. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not going to chat about, you know, whether or not that's a good decision or whatever. You know, that's how everybody knows the Labor Party is run. Um, but what I will mention is that a consequence of being kicked out is that now she doesn't have any staff. It turns out that um, all, uh, all the people in Parliament, you know, they have their staffing allocated to them by the Prime Minister. And so, you know, normally he might um, have some sort of like a gentleman's agreement or, you know, following some moral code that um, all these people should get staff, even if they're not members of the Labor Party. But uh, for Fatima, uh, she hasn't had anyone assigned. And so um, it, we can think as well that, um, you know, the Labor Party, the Liberal Party, these parties like to pitch that they have some sort of values. You know, the Liberal Party will say that they're good economic managers. They believe in, um, you know, free market capitalism, that sort of thing, um, versus, you know, independent thinkers or, you know, independent candidates. Um, since they don't have this staff, since they have less resources to sort of do their research, do their thinking, then it means in obviously they're going to end up with like narrower ideas. Um, and you see as well that, you know, independents are more likely to, they're less likely to pitch themselves on, you know, this is my grand plan for the world. They're instead going to focus on, you know, much more local things saying, um, you know, their pitch will typically involve, you know, like I'm a local mum, uh, my children go to this school, uh, I love my community, uh, I'm a great listener. But then, of course, you know, if you have multiple independent candidates running for the same seat, then what? Oh, I'm a local mum, I'm a local dad. I'm a great listener. No, I'm even even better listener. And I guess how how do we separate them then? Um, so, um, in terms of this fleshed out plan, um, keep in mind as well that it's not just the ideas that appear in like it's not just the ideas that are publicly portrayed. You know, they're playing you know game theory as well in the back of their heads. Sure, we pitch this, but then like, are we going to end up having to backtrack this promise a bit and? Um, maybe make some concessions. Um, and so, you know, they can have the strategist to flesh out, you know, the sort of grand plan. And so then as well, you know, when an independent might come up with a grand plan, um, you know, do they know all the details behind it? Will it go as planned? I mean, we thought, saw, for instance, when Trump was pitching himself to be president back in 2016. Um, you know, many people thought of Trump as a capitalist through and through. I mean, you know, he was um, a real estate tycoon. But then, you know, um, it, it was not even much of a surprise. You know, when he got in, you know, he imposed various tariffs. Um, he was into protectionism. He ended up greatly increasing government spending. So, you know, this isn't consistent with the idea of a free market capitalist. And so you'd have to wonder um, how much were his fans aware of this mismatch? And, you know, he himself, was he aware that, you know, he wasn't really living up to this ideal of a free market capitalist? Uh, and so... Moving on, um, we can see that um, there's this, when I talked about the grand plan, you know, that gives rise to like some branding elements to, you know, the Liberal Party, Labor Party. Um, but then it can go beyond just, um, you know, a, a history, a reputation. It can get sort of locked in into like religious zealotry. You know, we will follow the ideas of the good book written hundreds of years ago, you know, whether that book is the Bible or whether it's Das Kapital. If you question the beliefs of the book, you shall be expelled from the party. Maybe the party splits in two. And, you know, I, I would be hesitant, you know, if there's if there are two candidates running, apparently both following the good book, but running against each other in the same seat, 
then you'd have to question, is this ideology really one that's going to harmonize the electorate? Um, there's also the notion that um, maybe the good book, um, maybe you don't get sort of excommunicated for challenging the good book, but what if the good book just becomes irrelevant? Uh, Yuval Noah Harari in his book Sapiens um, predicts that we're going to see a decline in Islam, not because, you know, people will stop believing in Muhammad, but more because it just won't have any relevance. You know, if we think about should we build high-speed rail, um, you know, should we be allowed to, um, you know, use precision fermentation to grow protein in a factory or a lab, as some people would say, um, what does, you know, the Quran say about that? Well, it doesn't mention it. And so if we're thinking about how should we run our modern society, what laws should we set in Australian parliament, all of these books, hundreds of years old, just don't have enough insight for us. Uh, so we need to always be evolving new ideas. And as well, in terms of the the branding lock-in, we see, for instance, um, if you're going to have a workers' party or the Labor Party, you know, inherently it means you have to have workers. You have to have jobs, jobs, jobs. So if something is pitched like universal basic income, then, you know, the workers might actually like it. But, you know, the union bosses and in turn the Labor Party aren't going to adopt the idea anyway. Um, so moving on. Oh, another good instance is um, the ban the box movement in the US. Uh, so when you apply for jobs, there used to be a box, you know, it was common. Um, the box would ask, um, uh, you know, hey, do you have a criminal background? And then um, anyone who did have a criminal background would be discriminated against, they wouldn't be employed. And so the idea of how to solve this, they had um, these pe pe people were banned, uh, sorry, the people were campaigning, you know, ban the box, don't ask anyone if they have a criminal background. Uh, so instead, this stigma was applied to all young black men. Um, employers were just guessing, well, I'm not allowed to ask if they have a criminal background, but, you know, they're young and black, so what are the odds? And so then, you know, I would argue that it ended up being an even worse problem, um, affecting an even larger group of people being discriminated against. Um, but then, you know, of course, they'd already branded their movement as Band the Box. They hadn't branded the movement as, you know, fairer workplace hiring practices. Um, so anyway, um, moving, oh, sorry, uh, one last point is that um, you can, uh, the, uh, in expanding on the point of maybe a narrow branding, uh, so we see, for instance, the Legalized Cannabis Party, um, where, you know, they, they're a party, so they could have the, the benefit of like um, sharing a broader set of ideas, um, but then, you know, some people are hesitant to vote for them because they question um, if we elect you, you know, we only know about a subset of your ideas. What are you going to do the rest of the time? Um, although parties such as the Animal Justice Party, sure, they have the narrow branding, but um, they do actually have the wider thinking. Animal Justice Party have signed up to the Climate Accords, uh, same as Fusion. So anyway, um, moving on, the second difference I wanted to talk about between parties and independent candidates is uh, sticking to their values. Um, so we talked before about, you know, branding around maybe like a, you know, the good book apparently. Um, but what happens when parties sell out um, and why might they do it? We can think of an individual candidate. They might sell out to their mates. Uh, you know, maybe my mate is the publican and I'll say, uh, sure, I want high density for, you know, Brunswick. But, uh, you know, you're my mate and so I make sure that, you know, you get to keep a good view versus, you know, the same sort of corruption isn't going to play out for parties. Parties have connections with corporations um, and, you know, they can, um, we hear about, you know, regulatory capture, uh, that sort of thing. And so they can both sell out, but they're going to sell out in different ways. Uh, and we see just in the last few days, you know, Labor, for instance, they were talking about um, possibly banning gambling ads on TV. Um, but then they say, we're not going to do that because it's going to hurt, you know, publishers and sporting leagues. And it's, you know, you say you have a set of values, but then if you're going to not stick to the values for such silly reasons, um, you know, no wonder people question, like, you know, does the Labor Party actually stand for anything? Um, we saw as well, actually, in Bridget's electorate, um, you know, the Greens, you know, they brand themselves as, you know, caring about the environment, caring about, you know, Aboriginal Australians. And yet when they were modifying a golf course recently, you know, environmental planning, who cares? 
they cut down a bunch of trees. Turns out um, there were two sacred Aboriginal trees there. One of them's damaged, the other one is missing. And yet this is the party that says they care about trees and Aboriginal people. So uh, that's how we see the, the parties selling out differently. Um, we, in terms of selling out, obviously, um, it's it's not necessarily a party decision as a whole, it's individual people. And so one problem with parties is that they can be infiltrated by people who don't share the party values. Um, thankfully, fusion, you know, any, any sort of power hungry people, it doesn't make sense for them to join fusion. We haven't got any candidates elected anywhere just yet. So if you were especially power hungry, you would logically join, you know, the Liberal Party, Nationals, that sort of thing, an established presence where you can kiss the ring and move up the ranks. Um, and so lastly, the, the third difference I wanted to talk about is the motivation. Um, parties are good, not just for sharing ideas, but also just for moral support. Uh, if we think of Mao Meninga, for instance, in his historically short one minute election campaign, would he have given up so quickly if he had a bunch of friends around him? Um, it's, it's not going to be the same. And so um, being part of a party means you have a support network, um, you have donors, when people say they're independent, you, you know, don't they have donations from all around the community? Aren't they listening to their community? Did anyone really achieve all that they did because they did it themselves or were they standing on the shoulders of giants? And so an open question for the audience as, um, as I finish up here is, is this, is anyone truly independent? And in the trade-offs between parties and independence, which ones are you prepared to make? Uh, so on that note, um, I see we have our two other speakers here. Um, Peter, um, right. would you like to go next? And um, yes, could fine. you please introduce yourself to the audience? Oh, I shall. Yeah, thanks. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name's uh, Peter Allen. I uh, I have uh, extensive experience of being in local government and in the political uh, political uh, sphere, if I can put it that way. I uh, originally uh, joined the Australian Democrats way back in 1977 with Don Chip and all those guys and girls, So, which was quite an uh, eye-opener for your first party. Oh, I was green as they come, and I don't mean green, green as in greens, but there's a greens that come and pretty new to the political game, so that was quite interesting, 1977, and Don Chip got up and all that sort of thing. But um, but moving on, just trying to kind of encapsulate you know 30 odd years in, in politics into in the, the you know three or four minutes or little there thereabouts so I'll just try and keep it brief uh from then on I um so I was about 21 then when I, in 1977 so that gives you an idea when I was born but um uh after that I became started to be interested in you know uh running for uh, office uh that came a little bit later on uh, down the track when I was a bit older and the first thing I was uh, interested in was in local government which was then the city of Nutterwadding and I tried a couple of times in 83 and 84 and unfortunately I missed out but uh, nearly got there in one case but in 1986 uh, I said well I'm going to take a, a month off work uh, long service leave blah 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 door knocked the entire electorate and I was successful in 1986 as, uh, as an independent uh, I wasn't a member of any party at that stage. I'd fall, sort of fallen off the perch as far as political parties go. So I uh, campaigned as an independent and financed my own campaign as an independent. So I didn't really have a party to sort of fall back on. Uh, and neither, which was in some ways, you know, it was it was harder because with parties... Uh, whether you're running as an independent or endorsed by for local government, you've got friends in the party that will come out and help you. And especially in those days, it wasn't postal, it was all attendance. So you had to ban six or seven booths, just like you do normally in state and federal, although there's a lot more booths in, in that case, but you still had to go through all that and man booths. Uh, but so we got there in the end, it was all family, friends, workmates. So we got there in the end and then in uh, then did a three-year term because I was three-year terms back then. And then that came through to 1989. We had a re-subdivision. And unfortunately, I lost my seat uh, in that uh, particular year. But we still had annual elections. So um, without not putting too much uh, spin on it, then I came back in 1990, uh, did another three-year term, um, and um, and then uh, got back in uh, in 93. And then, of course, we had council amalgamations in 1994. So that was it. So I was out for a couple of years. 
Uh, then we have the reorganisation under Jeff Kennett about the local government and we, uh, the city of Nutterwadding emerged with the city of Box Hill, became the city of Whitehorse. So in 1997, uh, came back and uh, uh, at that stage, I was a member of the Labor Party. However, at, the Labor Party was not endorsing candidates uh, for local government in that particular area. They did, they did in other areas, uh, but uh, in the city of uh, Whitehorse, no, they... The, uh, we decided not to be endorsed. So um, we were all running basically as, uh, as independents and everybody was independent, even though they were members of Labor Party. There was people in the Greens. Naturally, there was people in the Liberal Party uh, that were elected, but th 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 they were totally uh, totally independent. They didn't have any uh, anything to do with the Liberal Party, Labor Party. Or, you know, you know we, we were just all, we knew each other and we just... Uh, did the business and, you know, we were obviously being party political. We knew what to do and how to campaign. Uh, so from that point of view, um, even though you're independent, having that knowledge of a party behind you and how to campaign is is is, is, is immense, is immense. Because once you're out there and actually campaigning, I mean, I, I did run as an independent for state uh, state election. Um so I, I've had that at the bigger end. So that, that was, but as an independent, um, so taking those skills and knowledge, you, you can you can bring them into the into the smaller sphere of local government, which was good. Uh, I did get endorsed for the seat of Menzies from the ALP in 1998, and got the obligatory 32 percent. But uh, uh, won a few, we won about 10 booths on preferences, but we we're never going to win the seat, and that was a liberal seat, of course. The seat of Menzies still is. Um, then in uh, so in nineteen uh, where were you nineteen ninety seven we all we we all came sorry yeah nineteen ninety ninety eight we all came back and uh, we we're all uh, in local government and uh, we just, I just stood all those all those times you know in uh, two thousand two thousand three two thousand and five and then I gave it away in two thousand eight but all that time I was I was even though I was in Labor Party for some of that time I since left years ago. Um, I uh, remain as an independent. I think from that point of view, you you are on your own uh, in local government, but I think you you collaborate with you with you with the you know there was there was ten of us back then, and you collaborate with with with, with your colleagues to to achieve uh, the aims on the behalf of the city. Now we're all got our own you know our own little pet projects. Mine was basically. Uh, looking after sporting clubs, sporting ovals, community groups. Uh, it, it's heavily into capital works. Um, but also looking right across, you know, financial accountability. Um, you know, we went through some times where, you know, because we we had the City of Box Hill uh, Electricity Supply Department. Now, that was sold off, you know, when Kenneth sold the SEC. And, you know, we were supposed to be getting all these millions of dollars from the sale of that. But we, we, you know, supposed to get 160, but... We only end up with sixty-two million, which is not, which I mean, it's not bad, and the city has still has still got that today. But uh, so I mean, we, you know, so we had money to allocate, and there was capital works projects, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but I, I would tread carefully about getting endorsed in this particular area, uh, in in eastern suburbs. I don't think people would go for uh, being endorsed by a party, either either the major parties or indeed uh, a, a minor party. Um, we have had Greens elected to the city of uh, Whitehorse. It doesn't, it, it doesn't, it didn't seem to bother people uh, because under their constitution, you had to be endorsed to run uh, with the Greens. So they, they, you know, they, they were successful. So, you know, perhaps I could, you know, bite my tongue on that, but uh, uh, they were good candidates anyway. Whether they were Greens or not, they were good candidates. And some of them, uh, in both cases, I think they became they went on to become mayor. So they 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 still, even though members of the party, they still had the support of their uh, in so called independent candidates. So from that point of view, but um, um, if I can just just turn to this year's campaigning very briefly, if I may. Um, there are a number of changes to to the uh, legislation uh, for the twenty twenty four elections. I'll just go down through just 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 I'll just try and be as brief as possible, Owen, uh, with a number of points. Um, 
the um, the rolls close on the seventh of August, so everybody knows that. So that's all done. Um, the all elections that, uh, in for twenty twenty four are all by uh, post. There's no attendance election. Uh, nominations open on the 9th of September and they close on the 17th of September at 12 noon. Make sure you're not going to be like the New South Wales Liberals and miss out and make sure you have your nomination form in personally by the, by that time. Hopefully you would have done that already. There's $250 cash deposit to nominate and if you get more than 4%, you get that back. Um, the online candidate helper... Uh, is now available, uh, and I've used it, and I've uh, nearly completed all my forms there, and, and they're fantastic. It's just great. You just go for it, all lodged, even your photograph, and you run off the forms, and you make an appointment to see the election manager and uh, before the 17th, like the 12 o'clock, and then you lodge the forms, and then you're on, then you're up and running. You now you've got a 200-word statement, um, and there's a um, nomination form, the statement with your photo, and, and there's the questionnaire form, which is a little bit of a new one on me because I didn't have to do that last time. But the, I'm, uh, Bridget would know a bit more about that, uh, where they ask you, you know, what your vision is and what your qualifications are. Are you endorsed? A few little questions like that. And that does go out to the public, along with your statement and your photo. Now, um, uh, there's the, one big change in this election is the fact that there will be attendance. Uh, when I say there's no attendance, there's no attendance on the on the on the on the actual day of the election. What we call, I suppose you call it counting day. But uh, if you're going to be away from the 18th, which is the day after nominations uh, shut and the the ballot has been drawn, if you're going to be away uh, interstate or wherever. Um, uh, from the 18th to the 25th, you can attend the VEC election office in your, not the council, not the council office, but the VEC accounts, uh, you can attend and vote in person, which is different, which is different. So uh, that that means, you know, you might have to staff a, a booth, so, so to speak, for that, for, that, for that period of time. Now, if people are going to be a way that they can register um, they can register with the VEC on a, on, online saying, I'm going to be away, please redirect my... So you've got options there as well. You know, you can either vote in person up at the electoral office, re regardless of whether you've received the post pack or not. This is, this is a point of conjecture too, um, because they're not posted out until the week commencing the 7th of October. So... Uh, you can literally, if you're going to be away, you can go and vote on the 18th, register your vote, and that's it. But that doesn't stop them sending you out a post pack. So this is a point of contention. So uh, people think, oh, well, if someone gets that in the mail, even though they have voted, they can vote again. Well, that's possible. Well, someone could vote for them, but there's a whole lot of, I don't know about it. I'm not, you know, that's up in the air about that. But um uh, so you can vote between, as I said, the eighteenth and the um, and the twenty fifth of twenty uh, fifth of October. So now campaigning. If I I'll just touch on that, what I plan to do during that time, as you know, they got rid of the how to vote guides at the uh, at the two thousand and sixteen. I think it was two thousand sixteen local government elections. You used to be able to put a how to vote card in in with your nomination form and your photo and your well back then it was your 150 words, but that's all gone now and they, they got rid of that. Um, so therefore, people don't have a how to vote card when they receive their ballot pack from the VEC. Uh, I counted that uh, with other candidates during the last little while, and I said what the best thing to do would make sure you when you do one of your pamphlets. You, you get that delivered the same time as the post packs have been mailed out with your how to vote guide. So at least they've got something there. Uh, I think it helps, you know, it helps with preferences. Uh, it, it makes, uh, it cut down on informal voting. They only just put a one uh, and all that sort of thing. So that's what I do to counteract that. So you've got, they've got, the, you've got your ballot pack. It may not sort of be, be at the, right at the same time, 
but it's better than doing nothing at all. So from that point of view, um, and then I might, then I've, obviously before that, I've already done one a pamphlet before that, you know, saying here I am, la la la. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to do a, a pamphlet right near the end saying, please don't forget to vote. Now that might be superfluous, but there, you may pick up, you know, three or four or five percent of people that haven't voted and say, oh, I better go and vote, or I can vote in person, or post it in before the twenty, uh, between the twenty fifth. Um, so there's there's all that there's all that sort of machinations to um, to go through. But um, that, as I said, the main thing is that voting if you're going to be away, and you, you know if you're registered or not. So I mean, there's there's a lot of things that for candidates to do. Go to the VEC site. Uh, make sure you're up up to speed with all the all the qualifications and uh, all the machinations as far as timing goes, because it's very very important. Um, you know, now parties, you know, because because we haven't got registered parties running like they do in New South Wales, and look what a debacle that happened there, because they've got parties that register for local government elections, so they can bulk lodge nomination forms, and that's obviously what happened. Where they mucked that up in Sydney. So, um, but uh, we, we're all, all, all on our own. We have to do it in person. So make sure you do that and make sure you, you lodge it before the 17th of uh, 17th of September at 12 o'clock with your $250 cash or banker's check. So, uh, or bank check. So, uh, but uh, it's been good. I, I, I'm running as an independent. I will stay, you know, if I'm a member of a party or not, I'll always stay uh, running as for local government as, as, as an independent. And I think people like it at that level. Uh, especially in the eastern suburbs where they're not used to uh, party political campaigning in council elections. So independent I am and independent I'll stay. Thank you, Owen. Independent for life, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, thanks, Peter. Yeah, some interesting information to keep in mind there for um, any candidates listening. Um, I, I think I mentioned as well, yeah, the, this recording will go on YouTube later. Yep. Um, but, um, yeah, this brings us to our final speaker. Um, Imelda, Welcome. Um, if you'd like to introduce yourself to the audience and, um, yeah, kick us off with um, your thoughts, the pitfalls for parties. Hi, guys. So I'm Imelda and I ran as an independent candidate in Lingieri, uh, which is basically the whole of the Northern Territory south of Darwin in 2022. Um, and I am now back home in South Australia, which is why you see a windmill behind me. Um, and, yeah, look, a lot of great information given to you by uh, the last two speakers. Um, so I'm not going to go for any of that. Um, but the thing I'll say is that, uh, so basically the the interesting thing about Lingieri, and I think the thing that makes me probably relevant to this couple of minutes, is that uh, a lot of the campaigning and allegiance to party and independent and all that sort of stuff really doesn't exist in really remote areas. And that was the thing that made uh, campaigning in the Northern Territory so unique. Uh, it's really grassroots politics. So it really comes down to how people actually perceive you as a person. Um, and they vote for you as a person. So regardless of uh, what your allegiance may be, um, they're actually voting for you. And uh, and that's quite a unique thing in um, in sort of metropolitan and more uh, state-based um, urban settings. Um, and I think one of the great virtues of that is that um, when you're in a remote area, people, if they don't like you as a person, uh, they just don't turn up to vote. They don't mind getting the twenty-five dollar fine because they're not going to pay that anyway. Um, so it so really it's about you knowing actually what you stand for, regardless of who you're with. Um, and people don't really think about uh, the party pitfalls and all that sort of stuff because usually, unless they really like you and actually believe that you're a person of integrity, they think you're going to do nothing anyway. But um, if they don't want to, you know, vote Liberal, Labor or whatever, they'll vote uh, for you on the basis that you don't represent those guys, but you're not going to do anything anyway. <laughs> so it's a bit of a lollipop um, sort of, you know, vote anyhow. And then, of course, there's that percentage, you know, that less than 5% uh, 
um, in those areas that really do take their vote seriously and they are literally voting for you to represent them. And, and that's very challenging too because when you're in a geographical area such as Lingieri, you, you know, are technically um, representing all of the cattlemen, all of the miners, uh, all of the horticulturalists, all of the, uh, you know, green solar people, all of the fracking people, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, it's impossible to have an allegiance or kind of a, a stand for that. So really, you know, you campaign on the basis that, uh, you know, if you're really concerned about something, I'm the person that's going to be approachable and I will listen to you. And if you can basically present me with a, a really good argument to take to the parliament on your behalf, then I'll take it there. So you really are independent in the sense that you are actually offering to, one, understand the people's issue and two, get enough consensus to then actually take that, you know, to the parliament. Whereas when you're bound by a party or a particular endorsement or whatever, sometimes you don't have that freedom. And uh, I think, you know, that was that was a thing that made standing as an independent in Lingieri so interesting in 2022 because I had a lot of people coming at me with a lot of different things. Um, and I basically had to say, well, look, you know, um, hopefully you can trust me to represent you uh, the best I can when I get there. So, you know number every box it's it's more about the vote than it is about um about you know how much money i can throw at you or what i can do for you etc and and i think in some ways we need to bring that sort of that grassroots thinking uh to a lot of the stuff that we do in other places and i think that's why the community independence projects in some ways has got people talking at that really basic level and i think it's an important conversation to have because it means we're actually thinking about uh, what government at all levels actually means. And there you have it. Hmm. Thanks a lot, Imelda. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting to hear, um, you know, actually being able to know your local candidate in a federal seat. I mean, it, yeah, you know, I, I think about, you know, the ones in Melbourne and, you know, the idea that one person can really get to know, you know, 100,000 people in their electorate seems pretty daunting, Um but, well, that's the thing. I mean, you can't. And so, uh, and you need to, you know, you need to say that. And you also, you know, need to say, you know, hey, look, one of the problems that a place like Lingieri's had in the previous 30-odd uh, years is it was represented by Warren Snowden, uh, who clearly did not get to know 100,000 people. You actually spend, you know, 80% of your time in uh, in Canberra. And then if you happen to get portfolios and committees and all those other mm. wonderful things that you get when you're in a party and stuff, you, as the people say, aren't representing them at all. Mm. Uh, whereas if you're an independent, you're not going to be on any of those things anyway. Mm. And so uh, hopefully you do have enough staff in your electorate offices to actually um, kind of go, well, actually, yeah, look, let's have that conversation or else take the time to travel and sit down and say, okay, look, I'm, I'm not here for a day. I'm not flying in, flying out. I'm actually here. I'm going to have two nights here you know, come and come and talk to me. Um, mm. And that's yeah, the benefit of being an independent. You hopefully can do that in, a, in an electorate that big because you're not going to represent the people unless you do. And you'll get four years because that's the term. You won't get it a second time. Mm. Yeah. It's... If, if you haven't at least had a crack at doing that grassroots politics yeah. in the first two. Good to hear they're paying attention, yeah. Um, I, I might mention explicitly um, if anybody else has questions now. Um, so the, the I guess pre-written speeches are all finished. Uh, so if anyone has questions, please um, you know put your hand up. Um, join in the discussion. Um, I, actually, Bridget, I have a question for you. Um, a few of us have discussed the idea of you know listening to voters. Um, you know we we hear now about the importance in Lingieri. Um, how do you ensure that you know how would you rate your listening abilities in Yarra? I think you have to provide opportunities so that and um, for the community to share their views with you. But also, once you've been doing the role for a little while, you also end up hooking up and knowing, you know, who the where the community groups are and who then have, you know, a broader network so that you can then get other people to filter information back into you. And that's what I really, when I talk about 
you know, leaning on the expertise of the community. I, I don't have the answers to all, all things, you know, but there is a huge amount of expertise within our community. And um, it would be madness not to, to lean on that or rely on that. So um, it's, it sort of is a matter of putting feelers out often on very, very disparate, different issues whatever that might be. But one thing I did want to just add to Peter, what Peter said um, with regard to preferencing, even though you can't publish a how to vote card in your VEC information, at the last election I noticed that a lot of um, candidates would be saying, I'm running on a ticket with so-and-so in there 150 words or 200 words or whatever Mm. it is. So that's one way of getting around that, Peter. (laughs) Yes. Yes, that's very, very true. And of course, you uh, under VEC rules, you, you get permission from each other. Yes. To, oh, yeah. Uh, yes, of course. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that 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 is one way. Of, that's one way of doing. It. Of course. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Fully endorse that. Uh, Simon, did you have something to say? Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear. Oh, uh, yeah. I just had a question um, for you, Owen. Uh, you, you mentioned something about how parties lose their way and stop following their values. I'm just mm. wondering, does Fusion have any way of ensuring that that doesn't happen to us? Yeah, actually, that's a good point. I should have <laughs> I should have covered it during the speech, actually. But um, yeah, I guess, you know, Fusion has our values, you know, our six values, um, you know, including ecology, advancement. Um, but then also in terms of how we flesh this out into policy. Um, so Drew, for instance, our president, has fleshed out, I think it's uh, 25 pages of um, the, our principles and values. So, you know, drilling deeper into the values, pretty much four principles per value um, to ensure that, yeah, when we're coming up with new policy ideas, you know, how do we ensure it sticks to um, sticks to our current values, but also ensures um, where there might be any sort of conflicts between them how do we resolve those conflicts? Um, it, it, it's quite extensive, yeah. And so, um, I mean, hopefully we'll be able to stick to it in the future. Um, it is a bit daunting that I guess when we hear about these problems of like, you know, the Liberal Labour parties being infiltrated by, you know, self-serving, power-hungry people, it is going to be tough trying to stop that from ever happening to fusion. And I guess, you know, these last few months we heard, um, you know, ASIO announced, for instance, there was a former federal politician who sold out to China and they were offering the Chinese handlers that maybe they should introduce their son to the prime minister. Um, ASIO didn't reveal who it was, but uh, yeah, I guess, you know, now there's this shadow of doubt hanging over all of Liberal and Labour um, if anybody thought that they did truly care about Australia in the first place. I have another question for you, Owen. Uh, your campaign seems to have the momentum of a runaway freight train. <laughs> Why are you so popular? Uh, I, I forget. I, what, I remember you were helping me with um, a similar question in the past, but um, <laughs> I guess we'll, we'll see how it goes. Well, I guess in terms of, you know, my campaign or, you know, Fusion's campaigning in general, um, I think there is you know, there's this latent desire where the most prevalent parties at the moment, people feel that they are indeed losing their way. And so, you know, Fusion's combination, you know, our focus on technological advancement, our focus on, um, you know, not brand new ideas, you know, universal basic income, for instance, it's, you know, when many people hear it, they think, oh, wow, you know, that 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 makes sense. Like, I, I can't believe that, you know, we would keep um, forcing people into this short-term decision-making. You have to get a job right now. You don't have time to, you know, study for another two years, five years, make yourself, you know, supremely relevant again, you know, reach your full potential. No, you, you know, you can't go a week without working and, you know, you have to make these short-term decisions. When people hear about universal basic income, they think like this is a fair way, you know, for society to be run. But, you know, one of the problems of big, parties is that they become very risk averse they've won you know in the current rules the current way of doing things and why would they put their arm out you know risking a limb on you know these ideas that aren't currently part of the um the overton window you know basically what you're allowed to talk about in the zeitgeist and so yeah i think the public have realized like real wages have been declining for decades 
Um, Labour seems to not really stand for anything anymore. The Liberals are flip-flopping about whether they support nuclear and, you know, what are their other new ideas for the next election? You know, they're, they're doubling down on anti-immigration again. We, we've already had that before. Like, it, it's just um, people are uninspired by the main parties. And I think that's fundamentally what's driving not just fusion, but also the community independence project. Um, so, yeah, fingers crossed that um, people keep thinking this way <laughs> when they come to the ballot boxes next and we can have, um, yeah, really fresh government for uh, 2025 and beyond. Uh, also, same question for for Peter. Yeah, you know, your your campaign seems to have the momentum of a front runaway freight train as well. Why are you so popular? Ah, why am I? I've never. Why am I so popular? I um, well, I can only put that popularity uh down to the fact that I I won seven elections. Now, you would, on reflection, you. Think to yourself, well, if I'm if I've won seven elections, when you when you when you stand back, so well, obviously I'm hitting the right notes with the people, and uh, it's active representation. Now, I, I all all the time I was on local government, I also had a full time job, so I, I was uh, perhaps I was nuts, I don't know, whatever it is, but I was, um, but I made a firm commitment that if I'm elected, you have to work to earn people's trust. But also you have to have you have to be an active represent representative. And that means not just listening, it means acting as well. And also uh, being involved with your community, attending community groups. As I said, I did I concentrated on uh, to a large degree with sporting groups and community groups and improvements to uh, those facilities. So I, I think I must have driven the the capital works manager nuts, I suppose. Uh, talk about being nuts, but uh, with the amount of um, amount of uh, budget time was my favourite time, and uh, you know, and uh, I mean, I love sport. I mean, I can't play for nuts. I couldn't play football or cricket or anything. But I, but I, I wanted others people to have the opportunity to participate right from an early age, um, and also uh, more lately, uh, especially with comes to Australian rules football, was uh, getting the girls and women involved, um, and. Uh, that was a bit of a hurdle in some cases uh, because the officers can me immediately think, "Oh my God, where are we going to put them? That means more money for a new for another room on for the for the pavilion. Oh, the women who want to play on the ovals, we've got to allocate more ovals. You know, and they they all you know put their hands up and all this sort of stuff when when you get the girls because the girls you know at twelve they had to give it away and they couldn't start again till they're eighteen. So what do you do between thirteen and eighteen? Uh, with the girls, mm -hmm. so uh, and and then that's that and that now has come uh, full circle, and, and that, that's a long time. You know, in the last 10, 15 years, it's come it's come ahead leaps and bounds. But the main thing is that you've got to participate with the people. You you've got to carry the people with you. Uh, it, it is a leadership role as well as a representative role. Um, and I think that if, as I keep saying, if you hit the nail on the head with the people and you active representation, you put forward your policies and your platform that uh, they're able to identify with, and you, you're not going off on tangents with personal agendas and you're talking about stuff that's mainly federal or uh, state-based involved. Uh, or international in, politics. Or international, yeah, international these days. You know, there's a lot of that going on these days. Uh, if you concentrate on what you're there for, your own patch, but also your wider wider facilities but also the main thing that a lot of people would like if you're as financially responsible with, with council's finances and i think that that was able to um to able to pay off as i said you know uh those seven elections that i won was was pretty good so uh yeah <laughs> from that point of view yes uh i, I also asked um, bridget the same question uh your campaign <laughs> seems to have the momentum of a runaway freight train why are you so popular um, I think what what it is for me is that I do actually listen and I think I'm a pretty good strategist, so I'm good at helping the community navigate their way through council policies and the bureaucracy of council that it is. Um, but also I think, you know, I'm, I'm a woman of my word. I'm 
people I think think I've got integrity I believe they do and you know I I don't sort of just I'm not trying to be all things to all people people know that I've got you know very strong principles of my own but they also know that I'm not here representing myself I'm here representing the community so I'm looking for a consensus across the broad community as to you know what I think is the best way to proceed with any particular given issue um yeah so I think that's that would be what I would say thank you Simon and uh, finally I'll ask the question to Imelda uh, your campaign seems to have the <laughs> momentum of a runaway freight train. Why are you so popular? Oh, I'm out of your own meat. And oh, oh, look at that. Am I there? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Right. Okay, so yes, I'm a runaway freight train. I'm known as Gan, and I'm not running for uh, parliament at all this time. I'm thinking about it next year. And, yeah, with all the guys above, um, you know, you've got to take the people along with you. You have to hit the nail on the head. You have to be honest. You certainly have to be approachable. And if you do that, then you'll get to Darwin before everyone else. <laughs> Good to hear. I wonder, um, actually, so we mentioned before about, um, you know, parties losing their way, people losing their way. I wonder, um, you know, Peter, Bridget, perhaps you two would be most relevant for this, you know, having spent years on council. How would you describe the transition? You know, someone, someone's campaigning, they're very enthusiastic, they're very passionate. How, how is it, like, what's the process where they just start to care less um, and, you know, are just there to collect the paycheck? Is that an accurate characterization, by the way? I think... Um... That can be accurate, particularly of people in parties, <laughs> I've got to say, because they they sort of think, oh, well, the party's going to chug along doing its business and I'm just here in the hot seat. Um, but I guess my advice to anyone who does get elected, particularly, you know, someone from a small party or an independent, don't drink the officer's Kool-Aid <laughs> is all I can say. Don't, you know, absolutely don't. Don't be pushed around and browbeaten because you're the person who's actually been elected, not the officers, you know. So mm. you're there to stand up for your community. I guess that's what I would say. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah that's, I agree with that 100%. Yeah, yeah. You, 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 that, you, you are the elected representative. Uh, there is a lot of argy-bargy between officers and councillors. And sometimes that's where councillors get themselves into trouble, I think. Uh, they think they're all lord and masters. They can uh, lord it over the officers and uh, uh, tell them what to do. Well, you can to a certain degree. Uh, there are codes of conduct these days and um, you've, only got, you've only got a certain amount of power and you've got to keep that ego in the bottom drawer, as, the, as that long-time song says from the Skyhooks. Um, you... Um, and, and that could be a bit deflating for some people. You know, here I am, I'm the councillor, you know, I'm the big councillor. And what I, you know, when I say jump, they should say how high. Well, I'm afraid that sort of stuff will go, you, you will last 10 minutes, if that, <laughs> <laughs> doing that sort of stuff. And that can be frustrating for some people. So when you say people lose their way, yeah, they can lose their way because, uh, you know, it, it is, uh, it can be ego boosting. There's no doubt about that. And some people... You know, they love it. You know, it's like a drug. And when they lose their seat, you know, they're all lost. But, um, and, and Jim Wilson. <laughs> yeah, well, that, yeah. I mean, that's, that's human nature. We're all human. But I mean, you go into this game knowing that you can win, but you also know, you know, you're only good as your last election and, and, or the next election, I should say. You're only good as the next election. And, and, and if, and if, you know, people beat you, I mean, I've beaten a number of councils over the year, which is, which is really good, you know, as, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, not too good for them, but anyway, that's the way. That's politics. But um, but the main thing is that you don't lose your way. Um, I, and I I think that uh, there's enough help there from your colleagues. And you know, if you need to get get for God's sake, get professional help. But um, uh, don't lose your way. Um, is that covering the point? Owen, yeah, or it's um. I, I I was mainly curious about like what the process is, how the, how they do start to lose their way. I, oh. I was. I was presuming it was more sort of corruption and kickbacks. 
But it, oh, it's, well, it's I didn't. Weird. Yeah, I didn't know you were getting that. <laughs> well, okay. Oh. I have never seen that, uh, and oh. I never participated in myself. I must say, but I, um, I, I, I've never actually seen anybody being bribed or not bribed, you know, or bribed or anything like that. You know, oh, you, you never suspected it, yeah. You never. I've never suspected it, and hmm. and and voting patterns over the you know the nineteen years I was in local government, I've never never actually seen that but what i have seen though and, I, and I'll, I'll say it, it from a from a party political view is uh when i was in white horse council there was there was and uh, i was a member of the labor party but I, I sort of dropped out in the latter years uh because of policy decisions and from the brax government it was back then especially over the eastern freeway and all that sort of thing turning it into the the tollway that was a, that was my that break the camel's back as far as I'm concerned. Mm. But I did see, uh, you know, would you call it corruption? But I, I, there was a lot of councillors who were in the Labor Party and they wanted to go further. You know, they saw it as a stepping stone. And and I'm guilty as, as that because I was in the Labor Party, I thought, oh, local government. But I didn't, I was already an independent before I joined the Labor Party. So, you know, would I ever go any further? Further than a tollway? Yeah. Sorry? Further than a tollway? No, no, sorry, further... Politically, like like state government or, or federal government. Oh, I see. Wanted yeah. to move up the ranks. Oh, that's yeah. what I meant. Yeah. yeah. The scale up and all that sort of stuff. Uh, a lot of people did use it for that, and a lot of people do. You know, that's natural. You know, they do use it as a sound, you know as a as a sounding board for to, to go onto higher office, and there's nothing really wrong with it. But what I did see from time to time is when they use their position as a you know a Labor councillor uh, or a Liberal councillor or in the in the party that they support. Um, issues and, and and projects that the, the current state government or, or the opposition uh, want to want to uh, put forward. So oh, yeah, e even if it's not good for the council, yeah, they're, they're outwardly using their party political nous to try and curry favour with the government of the day or the or the or the pre selectors in their local electorate of the day and all this sort of stuff. So. That's about the only thing, you know. If is is that a form of corruption? I, I don't know. It, it, you know that that's for other people to decide. Um, um, but that's about the only thing I ever saw people lose their way a bit. If you if you if you can call it that way, straying from what their role was as a as a local government councillor and using that. So that's when party politics starts to to to, to right. uh, uh, muddy the waters, so to speak. So, uh, but that's about that's about as the worst I could I could really say about that. But uh, yeah. Anyway, they they get found out, or they don't get anywhere, or you know, that's yeah. life, isn't it? That's life. That's political life. Yep. Um, Bridget, did you have something to add? Oh, I was just going to add, sort of, on the flip side of that. You know, often people, if they've got a political majority, if they've got a majority and they're in a political party, they'll often work to shut down anything that they haven't come up with because they I want. Think the kudos and the glory, you know, yeah. look at me, look at me. And, you know, all of this is my great idea. <laughs> mm. So that can go on as well. Um, so, yeah, I guess. Uh, you see some of those ribbon cutting ceremonies and there are, you know, 10 people there. <laughs> yeah. A bit of a fuss. Um, but actually I was curious, um, Peter, you were mentioning in your speech, the idea that um, there used to be how to vote, how to vote cards distributed in the mail. And I guess a point that I guess none of us touched on is that um, one of the advantages of parties is that it's a pre-existing brand, you know, versus for independence, you know, you're starting at zero. Yeah. And so I wonder, you know, yeah. what, what's what's everybody's thoughts on, um, you know, how would we change, you know, how elections are run? Would we change anything yeah. um, to, to get around this problem? Yeah, that's uh, an interesting comment. Yeah, there's the uh, they got rid of the how to vote guides in the uh, VEC uh post pack and I think that was basically uh Somnirook or Somnirook or whatever his name was or did that deliberately uh when he was local government minister to get rid of the Greens. That was mm. basically it. Uh mm. and, and to make sure that the uh Labour who you know obviously they can you know they're far superior to because uh, 'cause they're a bigger party and all that sort of stuff could get more Labour or Labour aligned councillors in and get rid of the Greens. Mm. Uh, but, and independence and independence yes and and in my word and independence too yes my word so uh uh and that's carried forward to today i don't know why they haven't sort of gone back that way but yes 
Um, so that's why that's why you do how to vote. That's why I do a how to vote card at the same time that the, the post packs are being handed uh, posted out, and hopefully they sort of arrive at the same time. But that that's sheer luck, I think. Mm. Um, uh, and then people do distribute now. Uh, if there was endorsed candidates, look in certain areas. Uh, if you're a liberal candidate for a local government, obviously that'd be in you know Boondara. Um, Mul the Malvern area, you know, Glen Ira, and some of those particular wards there that have a liberal majority, uh, people would vote for that. They, they, there will be a certain percentage that would see liberal on the how to vote card or on the pamphlet, um, and they would they would vote for that. And then to say, oh, well, job's done, and that was it. And similarly, in the more western and northern suburbs or uh, Labor and the inner city Greens, um. Uh, there were people who vote for that. So, you know, they've got their political allegiance. So, yes, it, it, it is a brand and people will vote for that brand. Now, uh, and saying, oh, well, th that way well, they don't have to think about it, I guess, because they say, oh, well, I'm a liberal. There's mm -hmm. a liberal candidate, I'll vote for him or her. Bang. That's it. So not everybody will, but uh, it, it, it's, it, it's a good way of doing it. So um, it'd be interesting if anybody does do that. I know that um, it does do what? Sorry, if they do actually get endorsed, uh, oh, okay. Like especially with the Liberal Party, they're, they're talking about endorsing the Liberal, uh, a Liberal ticket for the Lord Mayor and Deputy Mayor and 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 the and the Councillor ticket for the City of Melbourne. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be a dry run for better things to come in the, in in future years, um, and it's getting like New South Wales is, where you have endorsed candidates and tickets and everything like that and in and, and, and to a certain degree in Queensland too uh perhaps perhaps we are we are um perhaps we are not more naive in, in Victoria perhaps we you know we, we should come out and really say that what we are well I, oh, I've said what I am but perhaps people should say what you know if they're Liberal Labor Green or or Nationals you know in the in the country areas and all that sort of stuff and be done with it but I mean is that I mean you could ask the question um that's the question. Do you want to be that? Do you, do you want to have party political party politics in local government? That's the question as well. Uh, thanks, Peter. I, I'll just um, unfortunately uh, some of our speakers are running out of battery, so um, I'll stop the recording here. But um, thanks to everyone for watching, and um, we'll be having these events about once a month. Um, yeah, with other parties, other independents in the future. Uh, so make sure you subscribe. <clears throat> thanks, Owen.